Now, I don't normally watch these shows, but I've seen ads for them and commercials and different advertisements about shows that showcase haunted houses. There's a, the War of 1812. There was a house built in upper, you know, upstate New York, and some crazy person lived there, and there was a suicide and this and that, and now the house is purported to be haunted. And so they have TV shows where they come in and they bring equipment. And I always wonder, like, what kind of equipment do you use? You know, is it like with the Ghostbusters and the little thing that goes up? But they have all this equipment and they go in and they check the house and they try to prove that it's haunted and all this other stuff. And then, and you know, the average human being is not a naturalist. Most people on planet Earth believe in something spiritual. Most people on planet Earth recognize that there's something more than the physical world. And so as humans, we're drawn this, to this sort of stuff. Like, are there ghosts? Are there, are there relatives? Are these demons or goblins? Or, like, what's going on here? And so a lot of people flock to these sorts of shows. And then, of course, there's the haunted house challenge. They find the most haunted house in the United States of America, and then they offer you a, a lump sum if you will come and stay the night in the haunted house. Any takers? Anyone going to do that? Okay, just a few. Well, from my understanding of the Scripture, if Jesus were to appear and to take the challenge and stay in the haunted house, what I think would happen is he would sleep fine, and if there are any unclean spirits, they would be up all night scared. <laughs> so today, what we're going to talk about is, is trusting in Jesus' authority, and I'm going to ask you to open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 8, starting with verse 26, and we're going to find a story where Jesus interacts with a large attachment of demons. So we are in Luke chapter 8, starting with verse 26. I'm going to read from the ESV. And what we find in this story is that Luke is, uh, or rather, Jesus is near the end of his Galilean ministry. He's probably been in ministry at this point for about a year and a half. And he's going to be withdrawing from Galilee in the next couple of chapters. But right now, uh, he's in Galilee. And last week, they were on a boat. There was a fleet of ships, and they were on the west shore. And they crossed over. And in the middle of the lake, there was a massive storm. And they all thought they were going to die. And Jesus was like, hey, wind, knock it off. And then it just immediately stopped. And they were amazed at his authority. So they were traveling from the west side to the east side, and so this is what happens next. We're in Luke chapter 8, starting with verse 26. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite of Galilee. And when Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had lived, in a lived not in a house, but among the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him, and he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion. For many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. And now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him to let them enter these. And so he gave them permission. And then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in their country. And the people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed, and then all the people of the surrounding countryside of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. And so he got into the boat and returned. And the man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. 
Well, I want to get right into the narrative. What we find is that Jesus was on the boat. He had just calmed the storm, and they have now safely arrived in an area called Gerasenes. Now, there's something to note. Some of your translations, if you have the King James or different versions, may give a different name of the city there, and that's because there's a textual variant. You see, many cultures have probably gone through this city. The, the city's probably survived many cultures and many languages, and this happens to, for example, in France, there's a city called Orléans. And when the French came to the New World, they created a new city called New Orléans. But nobody pronounces it that way. We call it New Orleans or New Orleans. And if you're from that area, they might call it Nolens. But basically, you have one city, and there's four different ways to pronounce it. And given enough time, you might start to spell those pronunciations differently. So that's probably what's happening here with the name of the territory. But this was an area on the east side of, the Gal- of Galilee, and this particular event has long been associated with a site called Kersey. And so there is the Sea of Galilee, and on the right side, uh, that's an area right now. There's a national park there, and if you go there, there's an old monastery. And as far as we can tell, this would be a likely location because there's a lot of steep cliffs. Now, you might say, couldn't we pan to the right a little bit? It's hard to find high-quality photos of places in the Bible unless they're really popular. Now, someone might go there and say, well, wait a minute. If you go there, there's no cliffs that actually go right into the ocean or the sea. Well, that was 2,000 years ago. When I was a kid, I used to go to the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk, and if you go out into the beach, on the right, there's a big, long boardwalk, and to the left, there's these cliffs. Well, I went there 10 years ago, and much to my surprise, the cliffs are gone. They're just, they're just gone. Like, what happened to them? Well, erosion. Over time, the wind and the sand and, and everything has, has eroded the cliffs. So probably 2,000 years ago, there were uh, cliffs that were closer to the ocean. But this is the place historically where we think it happened. Now, this is a part of a larger area called the Decapolis. Deca in Greek means 10, polis is a city. So it was an area that was founded that you might call 10 towns. Now, this was all Jewish territory, but right in the middle of this Jewish territory, we have a Greco-Roman uh, chunk of land that is called the Decapolis. So everyone's Jewish, but then there's this section that is Greco-Roman. And the significance is that this is the first time that Jesus has crossed over directly and gone into Gentile territory. For the last year and a half, he's been ministering only in Jewish territory, and now he has crossed over. In verse 26, Luke refers to this area opposite of Galilee, and that probably has two meanings. It's on the other side of the lake, and this is culturally opposite from Galilee as well. So Jesus shows up, he steps off the boat, and he immediately encounters not one, but two demon-possessed men. Now you're thinking, wait a minute, we just read that and it only says one. Well, remember that Matthew, Mark, and Luke all uh, comment on this story, and in Matthew's version, this is what it says. And when he came to the other side, to the country of the, uh, the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him coming out of the tombs so fierce that no one could pass that way. So Matthew reports that there were two demon-possessed men. Now Luke only reports one. So what the heck is going on here? Well, remember that anytime there is a, an event, people who are there will describe different things in different ways. And what we would guess is that when he got off the boat, there were two men And then one of them probably fled and ran away. And so Luke only records the encounter with the one man. That is our best guess. So what do we, who was this, who was this demon-possessed man? Well, there's lots of descriptions of him. Verse 27, he had demons. Verse 29, he had an unclean spirit. Verse 30, demons had entered him. Verse 33, demons came out of him. Verse 35, this is the man from whom the demons had gone. Verse 36, he was demon-possessed. And verse 38, this was the man whom, from whom the demons had gone. So lots of activity going on in this guy. And he's never named. Which, by the way, is an interesting question. When Jesus begins to talk with this person, to whom is he speaking? Is he speaking to the man or to the demons? Now, what's curious in verse 28, the demon or the legion or the man refers to Jesus as son of the most high God. Now, this is significant because this is a Greco-Roman idiom here. This is not a phrase that Jewish people would use. So in other words, whoever is speaking is using local idioms. 
And I always wonder, do the demons, when they go into a region, do they like, like practice the local idioms? I don't know. I don't think so. But at the same time, Matthew's version records the demon or the man saying this. He's saying to Jesus, how come, or have you come here to torment us before the time? What do you mean the time? Well, at the end of time, in the eschaton, the demons are going to be cast away where there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so that time is coming. So in one sense, this person is using local human idioms. And on the other sense, the person seems to be concerned about the future time when he's going to be thrown into the pit. So my guess is, is this is kind of a fusion of demons entering this person, but still using this person's brain, and so the local idioms come out. Regardless, I get the sense that this guy was something of a local legend. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up in a neighborhood, there was this house, and it was two-story, and it was old and ugly, and it was covered by vines, and no one lived there, and all the eight-year-olds on the block, we knew it was haunted, right? <laughs> I saw someone looking at me at the window, and then who would be brave enough to jump over the fence, right? That sort of stuff. So I just imagine uh, this, the legend of this guy. I mean, look what we find about him in the text. We, we know that he was naked and crazy. He lived among the tombs. He howled night and day. And not only did he go out among the tombs, but he also went out on the mountains. He's out there cutting himself, and anyone who came near, he would attack them. So this was, this was more than a legend. This was a blight upon the territory. And I imagine the parents saying, you better not go out at night or the man at the tomb is going to get you, right? And the kids are all scared. So what in the world is demon possession? Well, first, we have to state unequivocally that demon possession was not a mental illness. People in the ancient world knew the difference between a mental illness and demon possession, and the belief that demonization was simply a mental illness is based upon naturalistic assumptions. You see, in other words, what people will say is, well, we know there's no miracles and we know there's no spirits. And so the only explanation must be that this was an ignorant, primitive people ascribing superstitious explanations to something that we, as the sophisticated scientific community knows, is merely a psychological disorder. But that's not the case. The internal evidence suggests that this cannot be true. Now, a person doesn't have to believe the Scripture, but the Scripture describes it in such a way that this cannot be a mental illness. Look what Mark says in his version. It says, no one could bind him anymore. So at one time, they could bind him. Not even with a chain. For he had been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chain apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. No one. This guy lived among the tombs. He was probably skinny and wretched. Looked like Golem from the Lord of the Rings, right? And no one could subdue him. Uh, folks, look, a person can't break apart chains. They had bronze and iron. I mean, this was the Iron Age. I mean, they knew how to make shackles. It wasn't like a primitive people like, we'll just twist together some wires. No, they knew how to make shackles, but this guy would break them apart, which doesn't make sense because if you were strong enough to break shackles, bronze and iron are stronger than, stronger than your bones. Your bones would break first. So you can't just break shackles apart. The other thing is that this man sensed Jesus from a distance and knew he was the Son of God before even meeting him. You can't do that with a mental disorder. And the final thing is that if you get cured of a mental disorder, it doesn't often leave you and then go into a herd of pigs. So what was happening here was not psychological. This was spiritual. This was demonizations. Now, you might say, well, how did this guy get into this situation in the first place? We have no idea. He could have been walking down the road and then boom. Or was he doing something with the occult that opened up himself to this sort of thing? We don't have the answers. But we know that this is possibly one of the most severe cases in the entire New Testament because the demon collectively refers to himself as legion. Now, in this area in the world, the Romans had a legion there, and it was about 5,600 soldiers. So it was a large group of people. Now, are we saying that there were 5,600 demons inside this guy? I don't know. Typically, that word can just mean a large group of people. We do know that 2,000 pigs plunged down the cliff, so I think 2,000 seems like a more reasonable number. But what happens next is what we might call a power encounter. No one could bind this man. No one could control him. The community lived in fear. This was a blight upon the region, and this was a demonic power that could not be defeated 
until Jesus showed up. You see, when the man saw him and came before him, it says that he immediately fell down. Notice, there was no struggle, there was no fight, there's no duality of power, there's no Jesus and the enemy arm wrestling to see who is going to win. Jesus' mere presence brought 2,000 demons to their knees. Now, what happens next is strange. The demons know that they're about to be cast out and enter the abyss. Well, what is that? Well, that's the place where they go until the final judgment. But they're afraid to be cast out, and so what do they do? They beg him, Jesus, instead, can we go in to a herd of pigs? Which begs the question, can animals be possessed? Well, I would say from the text, yes, and also because at least 50% of the animals in my household are, in fact, possessed. (laughs) But that's that's another story. (laughs) So here's the thing. Um, I can only think of two instances of this, and if you find another one, let me know. But as far as I know, there are only two times when God negotiates with the enemy or the envoy of an enemy. There's only two times where there is a negotiation between God and one of the enemies. The first one is in Job chapter 1. Now, the enemy comes before God and is talking with him, and the Lord says, have you considered my servant Job? And this is what it says in Job chapter 1. Have, this is the enemy speaking to God, have you not put an edge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land, but stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face." Job, or rather the enemy, Satan, is saying to God, yeah, Job is a great guy and he worships you because you've given him stuff. He's got things. Take the stuff away and he's going to curse you to your face. And the Lord says, I'll I'll take that challenge. Don't touch the man. Take everything else and we'll see what happens. So the enemy and the Lord have this negotiation and the Lord allows this to continue. So the only other time where there is a negotiation between the enemy or a servant of the enemy and the Lord is in Luke chapter 8 in this story. And so the negotiation basically is the same thing. What the test could be, the, way, the, way, the, the reason why Jesus would then send this into the pigs, send the spirits into the pigs is the same reason. What do you value more? Here's a guy that's been terrorizing the neighborhood. Here's a guy that's, that's afflicted. Here's a guy that is, that is pitiful and wretched in suffering. Are you willing to give up a herd of pigs for the life of this man? What's more valuable, your stuff or this person? As far as I know, that's the, the only explanation that is reasonable to me. We're not told, so this is kind of a guess. And so the unclean spirits, collectively known as legion, they enter into a herd of cute little piggies. Now, as a Western reader, we can be dumbfounded by this story because it seems like a waste of money or animal cruelty. And so as Americans, we don't really have an aversion to pigs. We have have Mrs. Piggy, and we have Porky Pig, and we have Babe. We have all these cute pigs, right? And and then we've also been told that, that pigs are smarter than dogs or cats. Of course, you know, dolphins are at the top of the food chain, and then somewhere below them are pigs. And so we value them. And then, of course, bacon! We love pigs because pigs give us the greatest food ever created in the history of humankind. And so, so we, as, as Americans, we don't have a problem with pigs, although I will say from another perspective, um, people will say that Jesus did wrong here because there's no reason for him to have allowed 2,000 innocent animals to die. But again, this is what we read into it. Now, a Greco-Roman person, uh, a person of the Decapolis, They wouldn't care about Porky Pig or Babe or any of that. To them, this is money. And the loss of 2,000 pigs represents somewhere over a million dollars of damage. Now, from the Jewish perspective, what they would say, a demon was cast out, a man was saved, and 2,000 cockroaches died. No one cares. So the 2,000 pigs... 
they get inhabited by these spirits, they jump off the cliff, they, they commit, you know, they, they, they die. The, the community immediately goes to Jesus and they say, hey, hey you got to leave, you, you can't be here. They're struck with fear and essentially they failed the Job test, that, that their stuff is worth more than an act of God. So the demonized man is now free. In verse 35, he's in his right mind. He's clothed. He's sitting at the feet of Jesus. He wants to join Jesus. And Jesus says, no, I've got a mission for you. Go home and tell everyone what God has done. Jesus gets in the boat. He sails back to the west side, as far as we know, never to return to this area again. Well, what do we do with this? What, what, what is the scripture teaching us? Well, what Luke is presenting here, the overarching picture, is the authority of the Messiah. That is Luke's sole purpose here, is to proclaim the authority of the Messiah. In chapter 7, we find that the Messiah has authority over disease, sickness, life, and death. He healed the centurion's servant, and he raised the widow's son. He has authority over your bodies. And in chapter 7, he has the authority to forgive sins. This woman comes to him, she anoints him with this alabaster jar, and he admits that her sin is great, but he forgives her. So he has authority over your bodies, he has authority over the courtroom of heaven, he can forgive sins, and in chapter 8, he demonstrates his authority over the creation. You have a storm, lightning, thunder, wind, rain, waves, the boats are about to get capsized, and Jesus says, knock it off, and they stop. So he has authority over your body, he has authority over your forgiveness, he has authority over the creation, and in chapter 8, Luke is demonstrating his authority over the spiritual realm. He is absolutely authoritative, has absolute power over the spiritual realm. Now, we have seen Jesus interact with the enemy. Remember back in chapter 4, he was tempted, but Jesus didn't really duke it out. Satan came to him and tempted him, and Jesus just quoted Scripture, quoted Scripture, the enemy fled. And then later in that chapter, there was another demon-possessed man, and uh, it wasn't as bad as this case, and, and Jesus cast him out. It didn't seem like a big deal. But what we have here in chapter 8 is the most powerful instance of demonization that we see possibly in all of Scripture. He's possessed by thousands and thousands of unclean spirits, and not only that, Jesus is outside of his territory. Remember, it was often believed that gods were territorial. You go to this territory, and this god rules this area. You go to this area, and this god rules this area. So Jesus is out of his territory in foreign lands, face-to-face -face with thousands of demons, and there's no fight. He simply speaks, and the most powerful cluster of demons the world has ever seen is reduced, is reduced to nothing. So the first thing that we can say is that we ought to trust Jesus' authority over spiritual things. There's a, a curious tale in 2 Kings. And in 2 Kings, Elisha is the prophet in the land. He's leading. And they're inside this town in Israel, and they wake up in the morning, and Elisha's servant sees that the town has been surrounded by an army. Look what it says in 2 Kings 6. When the servant of God, this is the servant of, of Elisha, when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? This is a reasonable question. You walk out of your town, and your entire town is surrounded by a foreign army. They're going to kill you. He says, what should we do? And this is scary. Because remember, faith is the opposite of sight. What does this man see? He sees an army that we cannot overcome. Then he said, this is Elisha speaking to the servant, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Well, what does he mean? There's this massive army out there, and we've got this little city and no troops, and Elisha says there's more of us than there are of them. That doesn't make any sense. I look around, we don't have any troops. Everything that I can see says we're dead. Then Elisha prayed and said, O oh Lord, please open the eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around Elisha. You see, they didn't realize this, but behind the scenes, somehow in the spiritual realm, 
a place that interacts with us, there was the entire time a massive angel army, but the servant just couldn't see it. This, there's many more cases of this, but what this verse tells us is that there is another reality that intertwines with ours. That there's something out there that exists parallel to ours. We might call it another dimension. It could be a, a phase variant of our reality. Whatever you want to call it, we know it's there, but we have no access to it. We cannot see it. We cannot get into it. We cannot investigate it. It's a closed reality. And on occasion, the Lord gave people a vision or insight into it. And in fact, the human attempt to try to get there and see what's on the other side is what we would call uh, practices of the occult. And so this exists, what should we do? Well, you won't like this. The answer is that we're not supposed to do anything about it. Because remember, we don't live by sight, we live by faith. What we are supposed to do is trust the one who is Lord over this spiritual realm. There is a heaven, there is a hell, there are spiritual forces of this dark world. According to Ephesians chapter 4, there are angels and demons and unclean spirits. And I don't know how they interact behind the scenes. We don't have that information. But this is where the authority of Jesus comes in. He has absolute power and control over every unclean spirit. And we only need to trust him that he is sovereign, he is authoritative, and he's working behind the scenes. And this is why faith is the opposite of sight. We can't see behind the veil, but we can trust Trust him. Now, if you are a Christian and you've called upon Jesus as your Savior, you don't have to fear demonization because the Holy Spirit has already filled you so nobody else is getting in. And so what we're called to do is, as we sang earlier, is when we fight, we fight on our knees with hands lifted high. We're not to become ghost hunters or anything like that. We just trust in the Lord, follow after him, and we fight this spiritual war with prayer, asking Jesus to fight on our behalf. We are to rest and to trust the absolute sovereignty of the Lord Jesus when it comes to the veiled activity of this spiritual realm. The next thing is that we can trust Jesus' authority over our struggles. The question I have was, how long was this man in this state? How long was he being tormented? Was he married? What happened to his wife? What happened to his kids? Was he single? What are his parents, what are they thinking? Like this, here's this guy being tormented. What is going on? How long has this been going on? Not only how much is he wrecking his own life, how many people has he hurt? This man's life was a mess. And I doubt that many of you here have dealt with demon possession, but you've probably dealt with addiction, self-destructive behavior, and your own sinful nature. And when we look at this story of this man honestly and we turn the mirror on ourselves, we probably see some of ourselves in him, hurting ourselves, hurting other people. And so what we must learn to do is to trust Jesus' work in our lives. Now, in, in, a, in, a fee, or rather in Galatians chapter 3, Paul says something about this process. Theologically, we call this sanctification. It's the idea that you call upon Jesus as Lord, and here you are right here. This is how you are developed. This is you, but the Lord wants to keep developing us and making us more like Jesus to get us where he wants to be. So where we are is not where he wants us. He wants to get us somewhere else, more like his son Jesus. That's called the sanctification process. Look what Paul says about this. He says, if, if you can't read it, just listen along. If you have been raised with Christ. Now, this is an if. This doesn't apply to everybody. This is a conditional promise. If, if you have called upon Jesus as Savior. Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things on the earth. So this is the process where we have to learn to renew our minds and think things of God and reject things of the world. And he says, for you have died. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. He says, you've died. The old you is dead. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. 
on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these two, you once walked. So he says, this is who you were. You, you could be described as this type of person, but that's not who you are anymore. And then he says, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. See, this is a description of God taking us from where we are to where we ought to be, and this takes some time. Do you ever get frustrated and think, why doesn't God fix me of this problem sooner? I have this struggle, I have this fault, I have this sin, and I just wish the Lord would take it from me. And, well, I think we all wish that. But his time is not our time, and his thoughts are not our thoughts, his ways are not our ways. And you may feel like you're this man who's just out there running around causing destruction. But remember this. If you're struggling with your own sin, this means that the Spirit of God in some way is at work in you. You see, out in the marketplace, sin doesn't even exist. What is right is wrong, and what is wrong is right. And you just give into it. Just go with it. Just follow your heart. Follow your desires. Do whatever you want to do. You can be your own God. But the fact that you know what is right, that you know what is wrong, and that it hurts you that you do stupid stuff like I do stupid stuff, it means the Spirit of God is working in you, and that is a good starting place. Of course, we have to fight to overcome. But please know that Jesus is Lord over your fight. He knows your struggle. He knows what's going on. He's working behind the scenes. And the time will come, if you trust in him, that you will be freed from whatever the poison is that's got you. I think of this man sitting here with a blanket over him, and then he's, he's in his right mind. And he's looking back at the last five or ten years of captivity. And that's where the Lord is going to bring you. At some point, you can look back, and what is now reality will become history. The final thing is that we must trust Jesus' authority over the mission. This story is really the extension of the parable of the sower that we looked about a few weeks ago. Jesus went into this Gentile region to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. He's out there sowing seed and pretty much the entire region rejected him. From human eyes, this looks like a failure. In fact, imagine going on a mission trip with 30 people, and you go to a distant land, and you labor, and you work, and you teach, and you preach, and the entire country rejects you, and only one person comes to faith. That would kind of feel like a failure. And yet, this one man, Jesus said to him, I want you to go and, and tell your house. And what we find in the book of Luke at the end of the story is the man goes back home, he tells his house, but then he tells his city. And then Mark adds another detail in Mark 5.20. It says that he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. So Jesus says, go home and tell, tell your family. He goes home, he tells his family, and then he tells his town, and then this is the Decapolis that had over 10 towns, then he goes around to all the other towns saying the same thing, what God has done for me with this name of Jesus. But a year later, Jesus would be crucified, die, raise again, and in Acts chapter 2, in the city of Jerusalem, there would be Pentecost, and there would be people from all over the world, people from, uh, from Cappadocia, from Asia, from Bithynia, and the Decapolis, people who a year ago heard the name of Jesus. They would show up in Jerusalem. Peter would give this powerful sermon and would give them the information they need to turn to Jesus as Lord, and then those people would then turn around and go home and bring the message once again. And so Jesus laid some seed, and this demonic... Formerly demonic man laid some seed, and then Peter would later water it, and it would grow. And so we can trust Jesus' authority over the mission as we reach out to people, as we share the gospel, as we tell people what Jesus has done in our lives. We can trust that he is Lord over those words that we proclaim. Today we sang this song, our first song, 
a mighty fortress is our God. And I like one of the lines in verse 4. It says, And though this world, the devil's filled, shouldn't threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. A mighty fortress is our God. You see, we don't have the power or the strength to fight this spiritual battle. But what we do is we call upon Jesus as Lord, and he becomes our fortress. He becomes our shield. And when we are behind him, then it is there that we have this power and this safety. And so, my friends, if you have not trusted Jesus as Lord, this is the first thing. That we're out there alone, we're orphans, we're by ourselves, we're alienated from God, we have no fortress to protect us. And the message of the gospel is call upon Jesus as Lord, repent of your sins, call upon him as Lord, he will adopt you as a son or daughter, he brings you into his house, he will give you a room in his home, there are many rooms, he has a banqueting table, and then you will be in his fortress. But it might be you've made that decision, and today you need to learn to trust You don't have to fear the spirits of the world. You don't have to fear politics or China or Russia or whatever else is going on. We can trust in the absolute authority of him who has authority over death, life, and diseases, over forgiveness, over the creation, and over the spiritual forces of the world. We can rest in him. 